cow pokes, cow folks, every kind of cow children, cow girls, cow boys, any non binary, cow gals, cow pals, hoping no brigands will kill them, cow kin, cow skin, whatever cow you be. All cow children, every afflicted pilgrim, countless millions, any demography. Cow pokes, cow folks, every kind of cow children, cow kin, cow skin, whatever cow you be. Hello, welcome to Cow Children, various stories of the dusty west. Today's episode, The Pancake Lovers. Mr. Mayor, I propose to marry your daughter. Megan, we've been over this again and again. There are half a dozen counts on which you're unsuitable, ineligible for my Jane. But you said, some are gone, that if I was earning, if I had a thousand pounds a year... Yes, but you don't have. If I marry her, we'll be rich enough already. It's no good. There are other qualities in a marriage. This is all quite irrelevant. But you said you were willing to make an exception. If you were willing to take an exception for money, if money was all that mattered, then your other reasons must be bunker. I don't propose to let you wheedle me out of my farm. I'm not a burglar. I'm not a gold digger. I'm not after your property. No, you're after my Jane. And she loves me. And I know the traditions. I was never here to ask your permission. I was here to tell you we are to be wed come Easter. Oh, I see. Easter. It is a pretty season. I suppose this means the pancake race. You're damn right it's about the pancake race. The winner of the race is the next to marry their sweetheart. Ah, so that's your trick. But you must know you're ineligible to run that race. There are no rules to say women can't run. No, there are no rules at all. But there is precedent. I am a father a farmer and a mayor to this farmstead, and I am also an historian. There are no written rules, but I have written volumes full of him and her, he and she. Not the gender is the crux of the problem. Jane's husband will be able to sustain her, and unfortunately for you, a suitable candidate has presented himself. What? No. Who? Your daughter and I are in love. In that way, it is a tragedy for you both, but only in the short term. I've an agreement with a certain Mr. Corvax, who is upstairs giving Jane the good news himself. He will win the waste on Pancake Tuesday, and eventually her heart. Not if I have anything to do with it. I've no intention of marrying you, Corvax. Yes, I heard you the first time, but I do think you should listen to this, my wedding speech, which I've spent some time writing for our union. It comes from the blackest depths of my heart. Will you at least hear the extent of my passion? Go on, then. Get it out of your system. I have always had an affinity for pancakes, or as my mother called them, flapjacks. Not until I reached this town with its proud Pancake Day festivities and its centerpiece, the Pancake Race, the winner of which is, per tradition, the next to marry their sweetheart, did I realize the affection pancakes inspire in my heart would unite it with another. For winning the Pancake Race, I set our wedding upon the calendar, and today we are married with pancakes all around. Three problems. I don't love you. You haven't won a race yet. And winning doesn't guarantee you my hand or my affections. It just means you'll be the next to marry. You, singular. And why is the speech all about you and pancakes? I didn't even get a mention! That is merely one paragraph. There is much more. I don't want to marry you. You repeat it so often it's like a thorn in my ear. But sweet words are stronger than such hatred. And I have an arsenal of sweet words at my disposal. Mag! Carvax keeps saying he's going to marry me. I just heard. Tell him. Tell him about plans. Jane isn't going to marry you. It would be a crime seeing as how she's going to marry me first. First and only. Ah, so it's a race you want. Well, I have news for you. This town has an old tradition. I already know. Then you'll know I've law, tradition and victory on my side. I'm going to marry this girl and you need to belt up about your claim on her. She can get extremely passionate, Carvax. I had just begun to read my wedding speech. Perhaps it will change your heart, Meg, as I know it will change Jane's. You've got to get off this farmland and away from this town, Corvax. My father seems to like him and says he has a thousand pounds a year. Oh, at least. Let him read it out. You're not seriously considering. I'm not, which is why I'm not afraid to give him a hearing than dismiss him. Ejecting him now would be indecorous. There's no need for jealousy, Mag. I'm not jealous. I'm angry about how little he respects you and me. Hmm. 
Mac is right. Pure churlishness. Is this what you prize over gentle manliness? Please go away, Carvax. I will return victorious. And then you'll be sorry. Sorry enough to marry me forever. A condition from which love will blossom. Get out. I will get out and think upon you in my heart. And you two had better not try anything tricky. My eyes are wide open, and I'll have you know that one of my friends is a lawyer. And having given them what for, I winked confidently and told them, Better watch out, cause one of my friends is a lawyer. Why do you keep telling people I'm a lawyer? Because you own a suit, Vim, and as you're so keen on telling me you possess a complete set of encyclopedias, perhaps you could use them to look up intimidation tactics, which is what we are deploying. Why are you so keen on marrying her, this princess of yours? She's not a princess, but she is heir to a farm that is both good and nice. One day they will say, she was heir to a farming dynasty, not that they knew it would be a dynasty at the time. But I know it will be a dynasty. Plus, I love her with exceeding passion. So what's the plan? I will marry her, and she will come to love me. We will have a child, and his love will bind us ever closer together. Yes, this will be a good marriage for me, but I am a competent man and can offer her happiness, security, and power. I choose my clothing with care. I smell well. I happen to be good at sex. I know it's a matter of communication. A game for two. And I tell you this wedding will be good for her. Good enough that she never need regret a thing. I meant, what's the plan for the race? I'm going to run very fast. What about Meg? I feel the fact Jane's an heiress is the main draw here, but couldn't you fall in love with someone who isn't already in love with someone else? There must be thousands of good and nice farms in the West. You're forgetting her exquisite beauty. You don't worry that you're uh, a bit mismatched in the attractiveness stakes. I hope you're not telling me she's out of my league. No, I'm no judge of these things. Because you know that is not a phrase I am keen on. No siree! I was first told that somebody was out of my league when I was nine years old. You don't know what it's like believing your future is wide open and being told you can't have something or someone you want because you have a personal deficiency that is outside of your control. I was told I couldn't enter the pancake race because I'm a woman. That's not what I meant. Also, my parents were hella poor. I'm too short to be in the cavalry. All right, all right. So we all have our sob stories. But to learn when you're a child that you are not good enough for love. Love, which ought to be the great leveller. The one thing in the universe which should be good and fair. Actually, I was born ugly. My mother had a fit. So 90% of everyone was out of my league. I was told I'd be a late bloomer. But honestly, I'm glad. It gets me into more interesting situations. Probably protected me from the worst half of pretty people and got me to meet the interesting half of the worst people. Jubney, you're not ugly. You're just asymmetrical and I can respect that. I am ugly. I wish you'd respect that. It's good. It means I can be proud of anything I do. I don't know what princesses like Jane base their self-worth on. She is not a princess. She's a prize. I feel like your plots and plans would run a bit smoother if your lust was something you were able to turn off. You will never understand love, Vim. You are a glutton for nothing. Well, sums me up. Why must I surround myself with such a gang of ignorant asexual wastrels? I need my horde of brigands to understand the nature of my passion. I'm not asexual. I'm bi. What? Bisexual. Well, I don't even know what that is. Image is gay for women and gay for men. For anyone, even. Oh. Well, you're not attractive to me anyway, so it's of no real consequence today. What we're learning today is that Corvax doesn't know a thing about us. I know lots of things about you all. God haunt you. This is why I don't like having friends. I thought we were a gang. We're a gang of friends. If we were a real gang, we'd have a name. Can it please not be called the Gang of Friends? I talk to my father, but I don't know what's going to happen. I'm ready to run this race, ready as I'll ever be. That's all I can do today. Hopefully we'll have the crowd on our side. That ought to help. Whatever happens, I'll resist Kovac's attempts to woo me. I'll find a way to be with you. What a nightmare. On your marks. I already am. I'll see you at the finish line. I believe in you. I love you. Come on. Howdy, and welcome once again to, uh, to the pancake race. It should be an eventful one this year. I understand there are a number of traps which have been secretly deployed. We'll be seeing if anybody sets those off. 
but the bachelors and the bachelorette are tearing along the prairie and tossing their pancakes sky high. Particularly good technique from Roger Davis Crusp. Unfortunately, he is not winning, but uh, his sweetheart is willing to, to willing to wait a little longer. I should say. Um, in the lead, we have uh, we have Corvax and Megany. Well, Meg won, so we'll see who gets the prize. Yes, you did it. Yes, amazing. Curse you! Your win is invalid. The town saw only one legitimate entrant cross the line, and that was me. I beat you like an egg, and it hardly matters because Jane loves me. It's true. That kind of love is make pretend. Her father will take my side and honour his word. The day is mine, and the bride, the crown, and the celebration pancake parade. You're missing the point of Pancake Day. This isn't a day about selfish getting. You have both missed the point of Pancake Day. This is not a feast in isolation. It exists entirely because it precedes the fast, the holy fast of Lent. Pancake Day is defined by this fact. It is a final feast before a long period of meagre pickings. You need to show me that you are capable of discipline, of going without what you crave. Lent is reckoned 40 days plus Sundays. As leader and mayor, I banished you from the town until Easter Sunday. If I see you before then, you will never wed my daughter. Be gone until Lent is through. What? What the hell? I'll come back for you, Jane. I'll write to you. And I'll write to you every day. Be gone. Come on, I'll see you to the edge of town. Can we trust your father? He's very religious. There's no way he'll sanction a secret Lenten wedding. Well, I've done my reading. I wanted to impress him if I needed, so I've picked up a few things about the church calendar. So here's something. In the earliest traditions, it's 40 days regardless of Sundays, so I can come back nine days before Easter if it looks like he's up to any tricky business. I love your ingenuity. I cannot believe you're honouring that speedy witch with the victor's crown. Slow down, Corvax. I don't know you, but I respect what you had to say for yourself. You were, I think, the real winner. My daughter's hand is yours if you wait until Lent is over. And if young Megan hasn't found some tricky way to gazump you. You think she would dare? Perhaps. What she doesn't know is that early traditions placed the end of Lent a full week before Easter, with the remaining time being passion tied. None should marry during Lent, but come back and be married on Palm Sunday. Dear Jane, I tremble for your touch. Yours with fervent aching, Meg. Dear Megan, I'm sorry to hear you trembling in the absence of my touch. Normally, I tremble during. So I've been at my least tremulous since you went away, which is in many ways a pity. Interesting that we have opposite triggers to urgicling and driving. I hope such a fundamental difference doesn't mean we can't tessellate correctly for a lasting life together. Do shapes have to be identical to tessellate? Or does tessellation refer to any two things that fit perfectly? I've read that it's good to treasure our differences, just as the body could never be all legs, all the time. Nonetheless, I'd be curious to find any stimulus that leave us trembling simultaneously. Yours, etc. Jane Jeffers Dear Megan, my last letter seems to have seen you off, or else the poster service has grown to a halt. Six days, and no replies. I'm sorry if I was too literal re really trembling. I think I've been nervous lately, and it's making me expound too far on little things. How was your week? I tried a good new sort of sandwich, and I'll be happy to send you the recipe. Yours, Jane Jeffers. P.S. I'm told I shouldn't try such tasty sandwiches during Lent, but it was on the Feast of Annunciation, which as you know, is the only feast during Lent. Dear Megan, hello! I'm hopeful the use of block capital letters will be more audible to you. Have you vanished out of the earth? Or has the poster service truly failed? Or have I wounded you in some way? This feels unlikely, but if I have, then writing this feels unlikely must make me seem callous and ignorance in sight of the injury. I don't keep copies of my letters, so I've been rehearsing over and over again what I think I wrote. With each pass, it grows and changes monstrously. If I've been callous, forgive me. I'm waiting impatiently for your presence, your scent, your strong hands, your manner, and the sense of magnetism that you bring into any room. Yours, Jane Jelly. P.S. It's me, really, Jane Jeffers, but I remember you once called me Jane Jelly, and it sounded fun. Dear Megan, I told John about your secret, or really, about the absence of them. 
and he supposed that you might be dead. So long have you refused to reply. John is too meek to say this out loud, but I can feel him edging awkwardly towards the suggestion, as anybody would. Are you dead? Have you passed beyond the veil? If so, what's it like? Was there a horrible suddenness to it? A sense of justice? Or was it slow and awkward with a creeping and encroaching? Like the oncome of sleep, or the movement of a family of spiders. Do you still get post on the other side? It's possible that none of my letters have been reaching you, alive or dead, yours, etc. P.S. John is my rabbit. When you were here, he was called Simonides. But I suddenly realised that I don't know anybody called John, even though it's supposed to be the most common name. P.P.S. If you are dead, my joking questions are in rather poor taste. But in that case, you'll never see them. I'm taking a risk here and hope my letters find you frustrated and upset, rather than funeral bound. PPPS, Lent would seem a tidy time to have a funeral. I wonder if anyone deliberately dies in spring with that in mind. Dear Megan, I'm not quite worried. I would make a rescue attempt to seize you from the jaw of hell, but I don't know where you are. If I don't hear from you this morning, I intend to follow the post through the desert and see where it delivered. I don't normally adventure. You might say I'm too staid for this sort of thing. And you'd be right. But I wept tears for you, hot bitter ones, all night. Don't be dead. Come back for me. I fear Carvax will try to seize my hand in marriage. You know he will. Must we wait until then to be reunited? Or has Carvax done you in? Don't be dead. I'm not in the habit of instructing anybody, but please know I'm in earnest here. Come for me. Yours, Jane Jelly. Dearest Jane, beloved dearest Jane, I've been kidnapped and held against my will these three weeks, chained in a cell by a man who thought a cell alone wasn't adequate to hold me, and he was right. Five times I nearly escaped, including two when I made it out the door. I know you will never read this letter, as I've no paper, and I'm writing this with my finger in the dust of the floor. Nonetheless, rescue me! Words I never expected to say to anyone. Rescue me, and marry me, in either order. Penning more tales of woe, Megan. You mad bastard, Corvax. When I get out, you'll suffer for this. An especially cruel insult towards a man so evidently set on marital legitimacy. I'll get you for this. Unchain her, bring her down to the pan floor. Yeah, I'm on it. Here, Miss Megan, is a shallow heated pool, copper bottomed over adjustable gas flames, the largest frying pan in the West, and sizzling away on it a great pancake. You two press out of the pancake and roll her up in it. Excuse us. No! What are you doing? You can't fry me alive! I don't propose to. Ow! It's quite hot. After all the hullabaloo over pancakes at the Great Pancake Race, you seem not to have the slightest comprehension of the process. The pancake you are lying on is cooked. I said to roll it up, Oof. but pancakes do not cook pancakes. The fire is out. The pancake in which you are being enshrouded is hot, uncomfortable hot, and significantly clammy. It is a cocoon, not a death sentence. See, you cannot move your arms. The foodstuff constrains you. Struggle all you like, but there is no escape forthcoming. Well, not yet. We may put you back in your cell overnight and bring you out to a fresh pancake tomorrow, and so on until your beloved Jane comes to rescue you, which she is persistently failing to do. Ugh. I'm not intimidated by being locked up, chained up, and encased in pancake batter. No? You really picked the wrong person to imprison, because I have no fear, and because, in all honesty, I am into this. The longer you torment me, the more you just showed me a good time. So thank you. Hmm... Miss Megany, I find sarcasm hard to read, so I, I, I'm uncertain whether you're merely joshing with me, but you're right to point out that you make an exceptionally poor damsel in distress. That's more Jane's sort of thing. Hmm, the role she was born to play. Why are you keeping me here in pancakes? You haven't married her yet, so there's still a chance. I could. I could burst into town some sunny Sunday and whisk her off her feet, but she would resent me and she would pine for you. I cannot deny that her love for you is real. I need her to see you beaten. By a pancake, you humiliated me on the day of the race. Within a pancake, she will see you at my mercy. 
and then I will eat a smaller pancake to represent my mastery over womankind. I will be the pancake victor, you the victim, and she the bold adventurer. I am turning the tables. I've heard the letters. Jubney reads them to me. Jane keeps saying she's coming for me, but so far she hasn't done it. Yes, she's letting the both of us down. Perhaps it's for the best that your love must come to an end. She can't seem to do a thing. I love her. I never said I was in love with competency, or in love with action or gumption. My love is for a real human woman, not some sort of romantic ideal of heroism and whatever the opposite of torpor is. Ah, so you admit it, she is being torpid. Yes, yes she is. She has a good heart and a tenderness. Which nonetheless fails to rouse her to action. Sometimes being good isn't about doing anything at all, ever. Sometimes it's just pure good. I don't know how that would even exist. Or well, what's torpid, then? It's like lethargy. Sluggishness. Though I never knew a lady who less resembled a slug. Every day I write to you, and every day I cry for you. Lent has never seemed so wan. I almost told father that you haven't been writing. But I feared he'd gloat. I like to think he isn't the gloating kind, but our love life and my marriage is business. And he is, amongst many other things, a businessman. At best, he would be amused by the uncertainty around our promised union. Perhaps he would commend you for keeping your distance, or instruct me about loss and Lent, and how my mind is too much on the celebration at the end, not enough on living with discipline. I hate this time of year, and I hate this year most of all, but I will forgive it if it delivers you to me. But I have said, and you, I hope, have read that I will come looking for you. Every day I think, today is the day I will follow the postwoman. Yet, every day I don't. I make excuses, and then despise and condemn myself for tarrying. I don't know why. When I long for your arms, I cannot stir myself to action. Tomorrow I will come to you. Tomorrow I will find you. I'll save you. I'll come to the light to Spencer's grave, and weep and live forever as a widow. Yours in pain, Jane J. Miss Megany, I wrote a letter purporting to be from you. I forged your own hand and made it chock full of hot-breathed passion and undulating anatomy, and I believe in some senses I captured your style as entirely as I have captured your person. Oh, Megan, it was to have lured Jane here with a plaintive cry of, Can you ever come and seize me from the jaws of hell? used figuratively to mean number 14 Factory Row, next to the graveyard, West Coppertown, the West. But I was a fool. If you're imprisoned, how could you possibly send a letter? It simply wasn't plausible. <sighs> so there's no escape today? No rescue attempt, no marriage, no pancakes. But I have a robust plan B. Jubney and Vim are paying Jane a visit and dropping enough clues to lay a trail of breadcrumbs to your cell door, we're making it more than easy for her to rescue you. Or at least, be lured into believing it a possibility. She's not a risk-taker. She won't walk into an obvious trap. But I believe in her. She will try to help. When? I cannot be the only one of us growing frustrated by this pantomime of nothing, where every day she does not come to our aid. How do you normally spend your Lent when you're not getting pent up about marriage? Until recently, I ate a lot of bread and spinach during Lent, thinking they were a healthy and ascetic alternative to proper people food. On reflection, however, bread is neither ascetic nor healthy, not when it can truly be called a lot. This year, I intend to give up being unmarried permanently. I never give anything up. I take things up. That way I don't spend all my time being all, woe is me. You're imprisoned, and the love of your life is going to be snatched away during a physically humiliating pancake ordeal. I'm not without sympathy. Now, if ever, you would be justified in saying, woe is me, or if you rather, woe am I. You're wrong. I'm going to get out of this with my heart intact. I'm not woe. I am won't. Alas for you. This was always a battle of the will. No matter, my associates must be at her door by now. My marital prize grows ever closer. Howdy, miss. Hi, Mr. Jeffers. I'm here to speak to your daughter, if that's okay. You're not another suitor, are you? Actually, I'm here sort of on behalf of both of them. That's novel. Joined forces, have they? Not exactly. To tell the truth, Corvax has imprisoned Meg in a web of traps and wants your daughter to go and rescue her. Or try and rescue her. Then Corvax... Look, don't tell me all this. 
It sounds like a solid plan, so I won't get in the way of it, so long as my daughter's not in any danger. That understood? I prefer not to know the details of these things, else I'll be complicit in every little thing. Is Janie safe? Yeah, she's everyone's favourite. All this theatre, just to woo her. Things were less romantic back in my day. Would you like some coffee? I'm not expecting Jane down here just yet. She likes to take breakfast in bed, and then spends the morning reading in her boudoir. Do you have a boudoir? No, but I had a big cupboard in my mum's house. I always think of Jane as like a princess. What, because she's bone idle? Kind of. No, it's more because she looks the part, and because she can be bone idle if she chooses. For most folk, that's never an option. I never expected to have a daughter. Thought I'd have sons. They'd be managing the farm by now. She could manage the farm, if you'd give her a push. Not the same, though. She can make a list and give instructions, but a son can go out with an axe and cut up firewood. Hey, I'm nobody's son, and you wouldn't believe what I can do with an axe. That's why you're what we call a worker. You're working for that Corvax, are you? Working with him, really. There's no money in it. He seems capable enough. Someone who could take things over when I retire, which, given my overall health, may only be five years off. Are you ill? No, but I could be. I should tell you, Corvax is kind of a jerk. Here's a secret. So am I. So are all successful farmers, mayors, and men. I appreciate the warning, but he loves Janie. He's made that much clear. Yeah, the man's smitten, and he's obsessed with the sanctity of marriage, so he'd treat her well. You've no worries there. Thank you. I appreciate you letting me know what's what. Meg's pretty solid too. Eh? I suppose it's always good to have a plan for all contingencies. But Corvax won the pancake race fair and round, and I gave him my word. I'd do anything for my Jane, but you can't always have what she wants. There has to be a limit. Well, up you go. She's second door on the right. And promise me again, she's not going to be walking into any danger. I promise. I won't let her anywhere near that giant frying pan. No details, please. Else I'll fret. If the plan has worked, my bride should be arriving any moment to spring her rescue. Oh, I can see her through the busted window. Good. Now we hold our positions and our breaths. Oh, she's looking a bit lost. Oh, oh, she's coming this way. Oh, yeah, here she comes. I was starting to think she wouldn't get here till after Easter. That's not funny, Jabney. Hey, I got her here. I've done everything you asked. Thank you. Is Megan tightly encased? Just got her comfy. Jane's at the door. She's just umming and ahhing. She'll be in in a jiffy. I was thinking... We built this big pancake place for this one wedding. But you could open it up as a restaurant or a museum. I had actually already had that idea, but discounted it as we're rather out of the way. But perhaps you're right. Perhaps with a seasonal hedge maze, and we could make it a day out for people willing to ride here. Shush, she's coming. Hello? 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 Back! Back! I'm over here, but it's a trap. I know, Jabney told me. Jabney. It was the only way to get her to come. She was worried it was a trap, so I told her it was. Then she didn't seem so worried. Are you? Is that a pancake? You could probably tear it open from the outside. Why can't you tear it open from the inside? It's more difficult from close up. My arms are stuck and I can't get any sort of purchase on it. Yeah, but you're strong. I think it's like how it's easy to tear a glove apart with two hands from outside than tearing it apart with one from inside. That makes sense. Probably like being buried in sand at the beach. Jane, can you just dig your fingers in and get me out of this? Um, Here we go. I'm free. Congratulations, both of you. I told you, Corvax. I said she'd get me out of this. You said no such thing. I said it to Vim. She did, actually. Hello, I'm Vim. Jane... I love you so much. Do you get my letters? Yes. Jubney read them to me. What was the good sandwich on the 25th? Oh, cranberry and cartilage. The two of you seem to be labouring under a misapprehension. Beautiful Jane, you may have fought your way in here, but you are outnumbered, and you lack the element of surprise. And you are both now standing in the centre of... I am crouching. You are both now situated in the middle of a vast frying pan. It may not be Easter Day, but let us strike while the copper is hot. Oh, Eck, it is getting hot. Jubney begins stirring the mixture. Vim, ready the sluice gates. No! And why not? I was happy enough making big pancakes to wrap her up in, but I'm not frying anyone to death. That was a whacked out bit of your plan. I wasn't actually going to order you to put it in there, not while Jane's in the hot zone, not while either of them are. But now you've ruined our bluff. Now we have a pond-sized frying pan without purpose and a fight on our hands. You're beaten, then. You built this vast plan, and it's all a load of bobbins. Jane, 
Nothing can stand in our way. You will not be taking her hand in marriage. You're out of threats, old man. I'm not frying anybody, but I have a gun. You'll be out of the frying pan and into the line of fire. A joke I only just thought up, but which is particularly apposite. Bring in the priest. Well, good morning. Good morning. What am I talking about? It's half past noon already. Good afternoon. Which is the happy couple? It's us two. Me and Jane. Don't you dare. It's Jane and me. Jane and I. No, and me is correct here. Because if Jane isn't in the sentence, it would just be and me. The way to be sure, always sure, is to take the first person out of the sentence. Jane and I will be married, but the couple will be Jane and me. If I take the Jane out of that, it's the couple will be me. You ignorant fool, the couple will be I would be yet worse. Could you clarify again who the happy couple are, as there seems to be some conflict. It's most unorthodox to celebrate a wedding during Lent. And if you can't make up your minds, I'm just as well going home. I'm only here because a funeral fell through. Perhaps we could provide one of those in the meanwhile. Hey! Who are you even trying to shoot at? I'm just shooting in general. As a rundown, your grace, Meg and Jane are the couple. Or Corvax and Jane. Jane's the only one who's definitely involved. But you've got a choice of husband or wife. Well, I've only brought liturgy for one of those. But it's quite adaptable. I reckon you can leave the princess out of the equation. Corvax and Meg are the two who seem desperate to get married, just not to each other. Pair them up, though. We could all go home happy. I'm afraid it's not for me to sway anyone's heart. Perhaps Jane might say a word for herself? Jubilee's actually right. I didn't want to say anything, because it's nice to be fought over. No, it's really not. It's horrible, but it's a lovely thing to be wanted. But this whole marriage thing only started because of the pancake race. No one ever asked me if I wanted to get married. Mag, I love you. And I always have. But marriage is a huge, great thing. A real commitment that I never asked for. You said you wanted to be with me forever. I do. But marriage is something else. It's like wanting to live on a hill forever. That doesn't mean you want to build a castle on it. I fancy your socks off, but fancying's easy. I probably fancy five people in this room. Thanks. Right back at you. Well, there are only six of us here besides you, so now you're just being rude. We're trying to have a moment here. I was just trying to... Mag, you've been off and away. Travelling, adventuring, fighting. I've had a taste of that today. The adventuring stuff. And it's really not my cup of joe. When you stop writing, I long for our reunion. But marriage has scarcely crossed my mind. I'm sorry. I didn't... I didn't want to lose you. I wasn't saying it had to end between us. Damn it. I think it is. Am I to take it that nobody is getting married today? I'm still happy to enter a marriage of any level of happiness, provided I can improve it and build it up to love. Well, then, the earlier solution of Corvax and Megan? Whatever. Don't whatever me. I'm a damn fine catch. Oh, oh yes. Admirable. Yeah, absolutely. But I was being polite for Jane's sake, as I don't want to seem like a vulture of love. But we do both seem very keen on marriage. Do you have any better prospects? I don't have anyone else to encase me in pancake mix, if that's what you mean. Well then. I don't understand I like this a whole lot, but I think I just lost all my suitors. Well, I'd pursue you myself, but I don't really go in for romancing. Look, we're from different worlds, Princess. But I've heard your letters... I'd be happy to get a letter like that. Oh, well, did we all just couple up? You shipping me with a vicar over here because it's not going to happen. Besides, he's probably celibate. I'm not that kind of vicar, you know. Not those particular vows. My only love is for the church and for the handsome mayor of Pignall Farm, but I don't know where I should begin to press for an introduction. And with that, they were set to live happily. More happily than the forks. Cow pokes, cow folks, that was Cow Children, the Pancake Lovers, by Ben Swithin. It starred Charlotte Perry as Meg, Jasmine Chong as Jane, Anna Gowdy Hunter as Jubney, Stuart Dunlop as Mayor Jeffers, and Tim Packer as the Vicar, with Ben Swithin as Corrias. All parts were played by members of the cast. Cow children cow will return kind of in children. the Straminius gift. Cow skin, whatever cow you be.
and it just leaves time for the day's joke. Did you hear the one about the pancake? It folded 